This is my friend Laura. When I first thought about this project, Laura was the first person I thought about talking to. I wanted to reach out to other Black folks to see how they were doing during this time in a city with such a small Black population. But I moved here, and Laura grew up in this city. I wonder what her experience was like being raised here, and how it affected or even affects her. And the thing about Laura is she's probably going to be straight up about it. She says things how they are, and it's something I always loved about her. And at the same time, she is so, so deeply feeling, and also just one of those people who can adapt to any situation. After talking to her, I understood why. This conversation really got me thinking about the assumptions we make and how those seemingly normal things can affect the people we care about. Check it. I'm not a pizza pie, is what I like to say. I'm not half pepperoni and half vegetarian. Right. I get to be all of those things at one time. I, I feel like I walk the earth as a black woman. Like, that's what, what I feel leads. I think that when I was younger, the way I understood that was that I had to be comfortable with being black more than anything else because that's how people were going to respond to me. Mm. So owning that and really feeling that in my bones was crucial and then I also and I didn't I never grew up in a black environment so I was I, I would visit black family and be in black environments but I was never like at school with yeah. or having a, or having even a lot of black girls or dealing with colorism but I'd go to New York and my cousin's wife would be like you be careful out there you know they like them light-skinned girls and I was like what the fuck is light-skinned <laughs> like, I don't even know what that means because <laughs> in my life I'm either a new or I'm not like and I've been called here. all the things. You grew you grew up here. I grew up here. You grew up in Santa Fe. But I did a lot of New York every summer, so I always had like pieces. And I was in Mexico the whole beginning of my life, so my first memory of like a racist moment was they would call me frijolito negro, mm. the black bean which is a really delicious black bean in Mexico. So mm. I'd always have a hard time finding insults in some of the right. things people called me. But, but somewhere around that time, something happened in me where every other racial incident I had through my whole life, I'd usually come home and be like, there's something wrong with them. Like I didn't come home thinking I want my hair straight and I wish I was lighter and I mm. wish I was a white girl. It would be like, well, I don't know what the hell they ate this morning, but they came out with some new shit today. Why? You know why, I mean? why? Where'd that come from? Where's that come from? I don't, I think my, something happened. I don't, I really wish I knew how to quantify it because I've talked to my parents about it before. And I think it might have been a little bit of both of my parents are kind of outcasts in their own cultural lives. Mm -hmm. And I think my dad told me pretty early that nobody was ever gonna get me. And that's been like painful and positive at the same time. Like I just don't have the expectation. I'm Mexican by birth and in a lot of ways by culture and by language what as does well. What mean by birth? I was born there. Right, so you were born in Mexico. I was born in Mexico and I lived there until I was almost 10 years old. Okay, and then? Two American parents, mm -hmm. a black woman, who, and black and Native American and a Jewish dad. And so we were always the weirdos. So there was never a time when I was like part of a community right. that was an established community, not one that was created by a bunch of misfits. And at 10 you came here? And at 10 I came here. And you, and you were going back and forth to New York while you were here? Because my grandmother, my dad's mom, mm -hmm. my Russian Jewish grandma lived in Brighton Beach. And so we would, I would stay there for two weeks or whatever in amount the of time, time in something? the summer. Usually while my parents were trying to make some money somewhere, mm -hmm. like selling paintings or doing some kind of business. So I would spend a week and a half or two weeks with my grandma in Brighton. And then we'd lie to her and tell her I was leaving or going to camp or something. And I would go to Queens and stay with my Aunt Jackie and stay in the projects on Parsons Boulevard for two weeks while my parents were hustling. And, and I that was would, like blackity black? That was blackity black, Puerto Rican. I was going to the store to buy Newports for her, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fitting in in New York meant being your most yeah. authentic self. You, you know, feel like, like that here? Did you be your, mo your most authentic self? Mm -mm. Why not? I don't. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> even like the randomest things, like I won't wear a tank top without a bra on in Santa Fe, and I totally will in New York. Why? It's more judgment. I feel yes. like I'm not allowed to just be it on 10 if I want to. Right. I feel like I have to kind of play it. Yes, that's, that's nothing like cultural. I mean, I know if I'm in, 
Yeah, I don't wear. Well, there's a little bit of cultural in terms of it being small town, in terms of it being maybe more Catholic in certain situations. What being a woman means in this town, as opposed to in other places, the, the elevation of thought in terms of what men around here's brains development. What? What? <laughs> what? No, I mean there's a there's a very, and a lot of this is haunting of being fifteen and sixteen, being the only black girl. Remembering when, and I was always on the basketball court, and I'd be the only black, only only girl on the court, on top of only black girl mm. in town. And when it sort of tra changed where I became more of a sexual, like where people started to see me in that way as opposed to the homie, that whore thing is big in this town. There's, it's, it's the creepy crawlies of this weird town in that way, I think. Mm. We were talking about how a few weeks ago, it's been months now, but who knows what mm. the t days are like, where I got the call from the mayor's office to come, like, to come talk to them about being black in Santa Fe. I remember I called you after mm. that. And my, I talked to the woman I was speaking to, who's one of my best friend's sister. She's white, he's black. And so I felt comfortable talking to her, and we talked about some of my terrible experiences in this town that I felt were mostly for being black. And she, you know, she's horrified and telling her that we had slave day at prep and people now like to act all like, what? In Santa Fe? No way. Th when you were in high school, they Wait, had that? that slave day? Slave day. That's what it was called. What, what is slave day? Slave day is <coughs> when a bunch of rich white people had a school that they built on the top of the hill so they wouldn't have to go to school with Spanish people. Mm decide that the best way to raise money for the seniors to have a senior trip to San Francisco every year is to have an auction where all of the seniors are sold to younger underclassmen. They're put on the stage and they have to do a thing. Come Not necessarily on, a thing on, like uh, a performance, but a thing. But they you know, it was a slave auction block. And they called and so it then slave day. They called it, it was called slave day and people got super stoked about it ahead of time. And people started, the underclassmen started deciding who they were going to buy and what they were going to do to them once they bought them. And then they would do things like you'd have to, they would ha the, the senior would have to be their slave for a, like the designated day after, like it might have, the slave day might have been on Thursday and they were actually slaves on Monday or something. I don't know how, I don't remember okay. that part. And so how are you, like, are people looking at you when this is happening? Like, like, how are you interacting with this? So I got home and my mom was like, how was school today? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know how I feel. I really didn't know. Like, I wasn't even upset by it. It just f didn't feel right. But it wasn't like to the point where I was like upset. It mm. was more like, not really sure what just happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I literally am not sure. And so I went to um my mom said, Wait, 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 what? <laughs> right. And we kinda had a thing. And then usually in my household what would happen is, are we sending the white guy in to take care of this? Yep. Yep. Am I going in to take right. care of this? And then we have a family meeting and then my we kinda decided it was gonna be my job to take care of it. Wow. With their backup. But my I had to do the work so I went to back to school and I told them that um, it was disgusting and that it was offensive and if they didn't feel like it was something that they needed to change that the following year I was going to call the press that I expected them to do a week before slave day of explaining of education explaining what a slave block actually looked like mm -hmm and what it meant in con in context as opposed to out of context and that I intended to be absent that whole time and I expected those all to be excused absences. And you're a teenager telling this to the adults who are Telling in that to the headmaster and the assistant headmistress, And how did they receive this? They were mostly quiet. They, were, they didn't know what to say to me. We understand. I don't think that that's the intention behind the thing. Right. It's our major fundraising event for the seniors. Right, right, the right. senior class trip is, what people look forward to for four years and being a senior allows you certain privileges and this was the, like that kind of an mm -hmm. approach. And I just, you know, I told them, I'm, I'm, I'm telling basically, <laughs> I'm a tell. <laughs> do what you gotta do, but 
<laughs> I'm a towel. And so they just silently just canceled it and didn't make a stand about it, didn't say anything. And for the next two years, people were conspiring behind my back to reinstate it. Like I was vice president of my class and the whole class was having meetings behind my back to try to get Slave Day reinstated without me finding out. What about your friend? Like, that's, are there, that's uh, a good question. What about your none. friends? Nobody had my side on that one. I've had people contact me through Facebook in the last 10 years apologizing for their lack of whatever. Outside of this, how do people interact with your blackness here? I don't feel very seen. I don't think, I think a lot of times people qualify my blackness for their comfort. What do you mean? I think that I'm as black as they want me to be for them. Hmm. Who I am doesn't make any difference. So I think that, like, for example, as we've been dealing with all this racial strife and it's been such a deep, like, emotional process and us black folks, like, know I see you, like, mm -hmm. I see you, mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're thinking about when you go to sleep at night, how quick and easy it is. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's easy for someone, even someone who thinks they love me, to be like, yeah, she's black, but, you know, she didn't really grow up around but she's really from here she's black but she's really from here like and that somehow unblack me <laughs> yeah i think that it, i don't think it's seen i don't feel seen in that way here and even now even now and these are people that know you know you though yeah i mean i think that they think they see me <laughs> but i don't think they see me you think they're doing their best not that that matters, but... I don't think they know what that means. Like, when you say doing their best, what, the f what does that mean? Right. I mean, maybe I don't know what it means. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, like, what's that even look like? I don't know what that means. I like, mean... what's feeling seen look I like? I don't... I would like... There's more conscious white or Hispanic people in my life, not very many, and actually probably more white than even Hispanic, who see who have intellectualized their white allyship enough to be able to recognize mm. that I may be in pain. Mm. But even that is like a fucking right. maze. Because even a lot of the other black people who are black like me in this town allow people to get away with, sh like at this age, like I let people slide mm -hmm. on things when I was a teenager, maybe even in my 20s when I was only coming home for two or three weeks and if some shit, oh, he said, again mm -hmm. and I told him off and I'll probably see him again the next time and not s seek him out but right. end up in the same space with but a lot of our friends don't draw those lines or think that certain shit is okay or haven't intellectualized their own blackness even do you think that you can kind of get a black experience in a black culture growing up here and not leaving there weren't enough black people for people to hate so it's not like you had this, like, black people uh, in the city. In the city. Right. They weren't worried about you sleeping with their daughters. They weren't, it was less of that, mm -hmm. right? Close to none in this town, mm -hmm. if you start including, like, athletes, because <laughs> that's the first wave of fear, yeah. right? Um, but I could, don't think I could have a true black experience here, except for the defending myself all the time and trying to explain to people why it wasn't okay for them to speak the way they were speaking or think the way they were thinking or whatever I mean it wouldn't come out until I went to hoop it up with all my homies from here hoop it up. <laughs> three on three basketball yeah. tournament right yeah. and I came with my Santa Fe crew which are all Spanish or Hispanic they're playing ball and one of the people on my team they're playing against black but mostly black team straight up call somebody a on the court mm -hmm. and I'm Uncle Thomas at over here sitting like you know like those were the moments where it was like oh here we go now I have to decide not even decide but now I know what you how you like I didn't ever have to hear those things from them because it was never an issue until it was and if I confronted them about oh come on Laura we don't even think of you as black you're not you're not like them and now I have another thing I got to sort out for you or just stay away from it you know, right? And you think, and also always waiting for that shoe to drop. Like it made me not trust p 
people and extra compartmentalize things because I knew that at some point this person is going to say something that I'm not going to be able to come back from. So is it important to have a black community here? Is it that, is yeah. It? I mean, it's even better now than it was then. But I think that like when hip hop started to be something that everybody liked. So suddenly blackness and was cool and blackness was everywhere. And even though there was a lot of clownery around that, mm -hmm. it also like demystified it a little bit and brought it into people's living rooms. And there was like crews of Hispanic people who were like breakdancing and in the culture and like doing the thing. Mm -hmm. And so there was a deeper, th th that's when there was like a certain almost respect. And it was, that was music. I mean, that was all, Yeah. like that gave us black folks in this town a thing we could actually hold on to, to be part of a global community and be acknowledged by our own. Yeah, I mean, cause that's what I keep coming to is like this, the, the lack of representation for black folks here. Like, there's no historical context of why we should be here or is there? Well, I think as black people and as black Americans, we should have the same, privilege as anybody else to know to be a nomad and to settle and to go wherever the hell we want and do whatever we want without having to face violence or judgment or denied access mm -hmm. I think that there's a generation that I've always been a little bit fascinated with and I hope I haven't necessarily stereotyped it but in my may, and maybe I've created some of it in my imagination but certain people like fathers of some of those friends that I'm talking about who are mixed in this town were black men that maybe came back from war, who came from tough neighborhoods, who came from mm -hmm. urban centers, mm -hmm. who left mm -hmm. on purpose because they wanted to survive. But they went on these adventures, these solo, and I think it's specifically black men. I think mm -hmm. it's also true for some black women, but I think that there's this who came out here and found partnerships and made babies and were amazing dads and created a whole outside of where they came from world. And they loved it because they weren't just trying to survive anymore. They weren't in the fight every minute of their lives. And they were looking for that, I, I surmise, you know, that the mm -hmm. reason they left Philly and mm -hmm. Atlanta and Mississippi and Florida was because they <clears throat> didn't want to live in that black community that mm -hmm. wasn't serving them or where they could be targeted or end up in trouble without ever looking for trouble or wh however they, they got there. And so I think there's a, there's a certain amount of that in part benefiting from or appreciating that there was no black community mm. in a sense. Like mm. they might've created their own community, but they almost wanted it that way you know yeah. i personally there's a part of me i love my santa fe you know i'm a santa girl i've got all the things but i it doesn't do it for me wait talk about that real quick though like what do you love it what do you what what is great about here the sky the small the, there's there's the dual thing of the bubble like it's nice to be in a bubble when there's a pandemic mm -hmm. right <laughs> but 80% of the time, I hate being in the damn bubble. Because? Because I don't, because everybody else is in, doesn't know what's outside of the bubble, and that makes me angry. Like, it bothers me that, like, there's all these people who love their bubble so much and don't know what's outside of it and don't realize that there's people suffering or don't realize that there's just a whole other world. And then also because I'm single and I'm black and I'm grown, mm -hmm. there's no access to there's very little access to anything that I have that much interest in here. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting because w the way I know you here is a connecting point of s not only so many different parts of the city, but like it doesn't seem like you even give effort in having a bunch of black people in your space. When I come to your when I've come to your parties, and I've been like, who are all these black people? All those things are true, but a lot of it is. I make myself accessible to black people. Like I, if I saw 
somebody sitting someplace. And I've done, I have friends on Facebook that I literally was like, what are you two black girls doing in this <laughs> place? Like, I'll literally, like, I have no shame when it comes to that. And it's partially almost out of an ownership. Like, I'm the cruise director here. Have you checked in with me yet? Right. Are you on my list? Right. Right. And it's not meant to be... I don't mean to make so light of it or make it kitschy or, make, or whatever, but it, there is, like, I want to know who the black folks are. It's to the point where when I get to New York, I have to stop myself from, like, smiling and, like, waving at people. <laughs> because I know people are like, why is this girl cheesing at me so hard? Because for the first, like, three or four days that I'm back yeah. in the city, my grin is, yeah. like, and I'm literally just saying over and over again, I love black people so much. <laughs> oh, my God, it's so amazing. Like, just that feeling. And I also miss the anonymity of being mm. amongst mm. black people. Mm. So that if you recognize who I am, you're recognizing more than my blackness. Mm. Like, I am black Lara. Like, if you say, you know Lara Rapkin, and they don't know who I am, you know, black Lara, she da 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 you're probably going to get to me pretty quick. Wow. You know? And I don't have a problem being black Lara. I am black. That happens to be who I am. But I would like other qualifiers. Like, I'd rather you describe me as cute. <laughs> mm, right. Cute you know, Lara. like, you know what I mean? Like, that would be a better look for me but I also feel like I've found as there are more black people here that because of the fact that there are so few of us there's an expectation that we're supposed to have some camaraderie and there are people that if I did not know you here I would probably not ever run into you like we wouldn't even like you wouldn't want to know them necessarily oh, I wouldn't know not to want to. Like, want is already giving it too much right. power. Right. You know what I mean? But they just wouldn't be in my world. And they, and I feel a little almost, I don't want to say obligated because it's not hurt, hurt like, I, it's not a diss. It's just, like, you're not my people. Like, some people mm -hmm. are your people, some people aren't. And just because you're black doesn't make you my people. Mm -hmm. And yet here, it kind of does. Like, mm -hmm. Like I take, like I kind of feel like I take that on a little bit as a responsibility. Like, all right, well I get it. We're <laughs> we're, we're all we got, so here we are. I think that's it, y'all. Yeah. Was that okay? That was way okay. <laughs> and then I'll make like African groundnut stew mm. with like. Beef, it makes me mad. And sweet potatoes <laughs> and yeah. spice and berber pepper and all that. It, it literally mm -hmm. makes me mad. This woman right here, like, literally makes me cry with her food. Like, she mm. is such a good cook. <laughs> and not just. Like, groundnut stew tamales. Like, I like putting mm. familiar flavors in, like, the, a delivery system mm. <laughs> that works. Um, yeah, I love it. So, I have, like, the French technique stuff. And then I've taken all the Mexican techniques. I'm, I was ready for this. So. I know. Yeah, I know. No, no, we out here. For real, for real. Lower. 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 And then this way.